On both sides, west and southwest of the fort, came the flashes and explosions of rifle and machine gun fire. My dominant feeling was of excitement. Then the smack of a bullet in the earth nearby modified this feeling. Jens told us that the present orders were for the machine gun to be prepared for action in a position for continual firing. The rest of us were to take up positions a few hundred yards ahead. I dug it with my bayonet to make a position near the machine gun. After a lot of clinking and arguing and crossing, I heard the rat tat tat of our light machine gun. The effect of this fire was startling and disagreeable. We were suddenly in an hurricane of bullets. I remember that I was supposed to be doing some protection. Unfortunately, I could then discern no figures at whom to direct my fire. I discharged five rounds, putting the sights at 1000 meters. It was the first time I had discharged a rifle in my life. Good morning to everybody, I'm Pep and this is the Spanish Civil War. In this channel and for the next three years we will follow the Spanish Civil War, its battles and the holocaust that it provoked. We've seen last week how the rebel forces started their final assault on Madrid, how the loyalist defenders managed to capture a copy of the rebel battle plan and how the first shots of the Paracuellos massacre were fired. This week it seems like there's just one battlefield in Spain and it is Madrid. The fighting for the capital that barely started last week continues and intensifies. The 9th and the 10th will see the 5th rebel columns continuing their push towards the heart of Madrid. During the first two days the rebels will concentrate their efforts in Carabanchel as part of the planned diversionary attack and through the Casa de Campo where the main punch should aim. The fight in the neighborhood of Carabanchel is vicious and it seems that the militias fighting in the city are taking their toll on the Moors, that are not used to that kind of fight. The 9th, the rebels will try to force the Manzanares, but they will be repelled by a bold charge of the internationals of the Edgar André battalion. The 10th, after numerous loyalist counterattacks, the rebels are just able to hold Mount Garavitas in the Retiro Park. Meanwhile, the battle for Carabanchel continues. A Republican counteroffensive at a strategic level is being cooked up by the Loyalist High Command. Its aim will be to strike the rebel exposed flank through Sesena and Illescas. It has been scheduled for the 13th, but that same day the rebels resume their attack with more violence, breaking the Republican offensive even before it starts. In the context of this Republican offensive, an attempt is made to recover Cerro de los Angeles, an isolated hill that dominates the country for miles around a strategic position that was abandoned by Lister's troop that retreated without authorization, fearing an encirclement. The hastily assembled 12th International Brigade, with the support of Russian tanks, will try to capture the hill. We started our episode with a quote by Esmond Romilly, nephew of Winston Churchill, that took part in that failed attempt. Because, yes, it failed. The Russian tanks were stopped by the rebel fire, and the 12th International Brigade, just 1,500 strong, lost contact with the other Republican forces. In the northern flank, that same day, the Republicans launch an attack in order to retake the strategic position of Mont Garavitas. The 3rd Mixed Brigade, the 11th International Brigade, the Palacios Column and two companies of Russian tanks will try to capture the hill, but will also be stopped by the rebels. Even if the Republican attacks and with them the strategic offensive failed utterly, the rebel advance was slowed and even threatened by those attacks. That same day, black for the Republic, a big battle takes place over the skies of Madrid between 14 I-15s and 13 Fiat CR-32s. The Russian fighters are not able to dislodge the Italian planes from Madrid's skies. The inhabitants of the capital will be captured by this epic fight just above their heads. During the combat, a Russian pilot will drop himself with a parachute after being hit by the enemy, just to be killed by the mob in Madrid that thought he was German. Because of that, Miaja will issue a statement proclaiming that every pilot's life must be respected, if friendly for obvious reasons. 
if enemy, because it could be a source of information. Even though the Republican Air Force was not doing that bad, we'll see how the Rebel Air Force will progressively change to night terror raids against the popular neighborhoods of the city accompanied by bombs fired from Mongaravitas, and that the same fate that the cities of Europe will suffer in the years to come was a decision taken by the rebels in part because of the Republican Air Force capability and the casualties they were taking during daytime. The dimension of these bombardments, this death from above that will terrorize Europe in the future, is something new in this magnitude. The strategic bombing campaigns of the First World War were ridiculous if compared to what was coming with the airplanes like the SM-79 that could carry up to 1.25 tons of bombs or the Henkel 111 that could carry more than 3 tons of bombs. During the Great War, the bombing campaign carried out by Germany will drop just 300 tons of bombs and cause up to 5,000 casualties between dead and wounded. 300 tons of bombs meant just a single Henkel 111 making 100 sorties. Back to our war, as we were talking about how the rebel air casualties made them change their bombing strategy for Madrid, we'll point out that this week, the 11th, a successful raid against the rebel Avila airport will set in fire almost a full bomber squadron. At least, a good news for the Republic. The 13th, even with the failure of the Republican offensive, a boost of morale came with the arrival of Buenaventura Durruti and between 1,500 and 1,800 militiamen from the Aragonese Front. The anarchists were there to save the city, even though they were meant to do it with Winchester's 1895, a weapon that was outdated by that time, mostly because its lack of power. They will be tasked to cover a section of the front near the university city. The 15th, Another rebel trust takes place, and they try three times to cross the Manzanares. The assault is spearheaded by the Panzers, and something remarkable happens during this assault. The Spanish Civil War is considered in various aspects as a prelude of the Second World War. Not just because of the ideologies behind it, or the countries that supported one side or another, also in a military aspect. We've already seen and talked about the first major airlift in history. We've talked a minute ago about the terror bombardments against Madrid, and now we have to talk about the mighty 88, a gun that was designed as a heavy anti-aircraft and that was used, according to Isdale, in the direct fire role it will excel in the future, for the first time during this rebel crossing of the Manzanares. Arrived at the other side, the Rutis anarchist in front of them will retreat, opening the road to the university city. That same night, the 11th International Brigade and the Rutis forces will be sent to fill the gap, but will be met by the rebel machine gun fire and their counterattack will be hunted. Let's take a look now at the rear guard, even if we know that in Madrid there is no rear guard anymore. We've already mentioned the massacre of Paracuellos in our previous episode, but as it will be carried on during the whole month, we'll talk about it again, even though during this week, it seems there are not many Sakas. The 11th, according to Preston, the issue about the prisoners held in the Modelo prison emerges at the Junta de Defensa meeting. It is said that the evacuation of the prisoners is taking place. After the Sakas of the first days of November, between the 10th and the 17th, the intervention of the anarchist Melchor Rodriguez prevented more Sakas, even though next week we'll have to talk about them again. The Republican state and therefore its institutions like the Junta de Defensa of Madrid, both already stained by the uncontrolled bloodshed of the first months of war, were continuously trying to retake the control of the state structures and to establish their monopoly of the legitimate violence inside their controlled territory. With this aim, the 9th, a decree aimed to bring their power back to the state security institutions, or in this case, the Junta that ruled the besieged city of Madrid, resulted in the dissolution of the Cheka de Fomento, controlled by the anarchists. Even still, some Chekas will remain not only in Madrid, but also in other Republican-held cities, taking their toll in death and torture. Also, that same day, another decree, like one we've seen before that had little effect, asked to surrender all the weapons that were not in authorized hands. 
Manuel de Irujo, the vast minister without ministry we already talked about, will write to Miaja from Barcelona where he went to visit Azaña the following message regarding the killings in Madrid the 10th of November. I have received news of lamentable events in prisons as a result of which large numbers of prisoners have been shot. Having been taken by militiamen using transfer orders emanating from the Dirección General de Seguridad and I would like to know the number of victims, the prisons from which they were taken, the names of those who authorized these seizures and the measures that had been taken by the Junta in response to those events. I need this information to inform the head of state. By the words of Manuel de Irujo, we can guess that in addition to Melchor Rodríguez, there were other important figures that were worried by the extrajudicial killings that were taking place in Madrid, where this week we'll also have to talk for the first time about misery, about famine, about the sufferings that were brought beyond the fight. This week, the capital will start using ration cards because of the supply shortage that was threatening the city. Keep in mind that Madrid has been growing lately with thousands and thousands of refugees that headed to the city when their home was occupied by the rebels, a city that was situated in a salient that was connected with the rest of the Republican zone just by a single road. And there was a battle raging there, a battle that needed continuous supplies of troops and for the troops. The situation was getting more dramatic for the people that lived in the city and the Russian card will become something familiar to almost every Spaniard as it won't leave Spain at the end of the war. It will remain reminding of the Spanish people about the consequences of the war. Far away from Madrid, this week the 9th, the rebel cruiser Canarias that we saw taking part in the battle of Cabo Spartel and that headed to the Mediterranean to threaten Republican commerce and to attack the Republican rearguard bombs Barcelona almost 350 kilometers away from the nearest front and 500 kilometers away from the Battle of Madrid. And you were not safe. Farther away, in London, the 15th will see Eden proclaiming in the Chamber of Commons with a bit of hypocrisy that there were other countries apart from Italy and Germany that were violating the non-intervention agreement. And with this international note, we end this week. Please don't forget to like the video and subscribe us. If you enjoyed it, share it. We have to bring light to the history of Spain. If you are able to support us in our cha Patreon channel, as these heroes already did, or offer us a coffee, this would also be great and would help us to carry on and improve the project. Let's make this possible together. Thanks for your attention. Goodbye and salute.